So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to focus on pressure-driven flow systems. And so we'll really be focusing on Purcell flow. And we're going to see how, because we've basically used the linear version of the equations, with some assumptions, we can take the governing fluid mechanical problem, turn it into a set of linear equations that basically can be solved via a matrix inversion. And fundamentally, that comes from a formulation of the hagen purcell law. <clears throat> and I'm going to write the hagen purcell law for Purcell flow through a circular tube, what we would call a hagen purcell flow. And that's going to be just slightly different from the Purcell flow between two parallel plates, uh, which I described earlier. If nothing else, this gives me an opportunity to introduce cylindrical notation. So I assume I have a tube. This tube is going to be aligned along the z-axis in a cylindrical coordinate frame. I'm going to use a script r to denote that radius. One thing to keep in mind is when I talk about spherical coordinates, I'll use a regular r. And when I use cylindrical coordinates, I'll use a script r. So I don't know what this looks like to you, but it's supposed to be a script r. I'm going to assume that this tube has a radius, which I'll denote with capital R. So capital R is the radius of this tube. The script lowercase r is the coordinate in that direction. <clears throat> now, if I take this pressure gradient, again, assume that the velocities at the wall are equal to 0, and I solve the governing equation here, I get a result that's very similar to what we got before. My velocity in the z direction is given by minus 1 over 4 eta times the PDZ. Times the radius squared minus the radial coordinate squared. The only differences between what we wrote before and what we wrote now is that because of the way I align my coordinate frame, this is velocity in the z direction instead of in the x direction. This is a DPDZ instead of DPDX. I have slightly different notation here. And then you'll see that there's a factor of 2 difference. And the reason why this factor of 2 comes in is just because of the Laplacian in this cylindrical coordinate reference frame is slightly different. When you do the integration, you get an extra factor of 2. OK. So that's my velocity distribution. If I integrate this, and I come up with the mean velocity, Let's see, I do the integration, and then I have to divide by something. We'll find that the average velocity is basically equal to this value here, but just with an extra 1 half. So I get minus 1 over 8 eta times dp dz times r squared, where this capital R is again the radius of the tube. <clears throat> is the integration to be from zero to capital R? Uh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. So this now gives me a flux. In this case, this is a spatially averaged volumetric flux. as a function of a driving field. And it's a linear relation. And the reason why this is important is because we're going to take a whole bunch of different processes, and we're, all going, to we're going to describe all of them in terms of spatially averaged fluxes 
as a function of driving fields. Again, this is going to be the way we're going to link together pressure-driven flows and electrokinetically different flows. <coughs> In this specific case, the hagen purcell law is basically something that relates the total volumetric flux, this integral of this average velocity, to the changes in pressure across some tube. So if I have a tube, and I want to figure out what is the total flux Q, of volume, as a function of the difference between the pressures at the inlet and at the outlet, I can now write a linear equation that relates, again, this flux with this difference in pressure that basically looks just like Ohm's law. And that law is called the hagen purcell law. So here's my average velocity as a function of the viscosity, this, um, this multiplicative factor r squared, and this velocity gradient, or this pressure gradient. If I assume that the pressure gradient is uniform, I can write this as delta p over l. And if I want to write this in terms of the total volumetric flux, I can say that there's a total volumetric flux Q divided by the cross-sectional area. When I do this, I can now write this form, in ter or I can write this equation in terms of three different things. A pressure drop, a volumetric flux, and a whole bunch of other stuff. This whole bunch of other stuff is what we'll call the hydraulic resistance. So let's see, I've got Q over pi r squared Now I've basically just rewritten this I'll take this L and put it over on the other side, take this R over here If I've done things properly, I have a pressure drop that's given that is proportional to a volumetric flux and this term here. This term here is what we call the hydraulic resistance. And we denote this with the symbol R sub H. And the subscript H is meant to distinguish between this hydraulic resistance and all the other R's we might have floating about, such as the radius of our channel. So if I write this as, uh, this, as a hydraulic resistance R sub H, I'm basically left with an equation that looks like this. And this equation should be reminiscent to you of Ohm's law. So in white, we have Ohm's law, which says that the voltage drop across a resistor is given by the current multiplied by the resistance. Here, we have the Hagen-Poiseuille law 
that says that the pressure drop across the channel is proportional to the volumetric flux multiplied times the hydraulic resistance. And because these equations have similar form, in fact, everything that you've been taught to do with an electrical circuit, you can do with a hydraulic circuit.